August is National Women's Month in South Africa. The theme this year is the year of Charlotte Manya Makleke, realizing women's rights. This Women's Month uh, coincides with a country beset by the third wave of the coronavirus. Thus, this conversation on women in health leading in the fight against COVID-19. I'm not sure that we have everyone, but we're joined by the MEC for Health uh, in Limpopo, Dr. Popi Ramatuba. We're also joined by Dr. Antabizeng Lechwede. She's the founder and CEO of Quali Health Intelligence. They worked with the CSIR to develop a locally produced ventilator. And Dr. Mpopoe is a gynecologist but has been focusing her efforts on uh, post-COVID recovery. And uh, Dr. Danella Eliasov is a specialist psychiatrist. Uh, welcome to you all, ladies, as we await to be joined by the, our fourth uh, participant. Dr. Ramatuba, let me start with you. You are a politician and a doctor uh, and uh, can i just start by digressing talking about political matters you were one of the names that kept coming up uh, dr ramatuba can you hear us hello oh, yeah. thank you um, yes i think thank you. I'm... thank you and welcome to the show yes, I had lost you earlier on. We have you now. I was saying that you are both a, a politician and a medical doctor. And I'd just like to start with you on a political level and say that you were one of the names that kept coming up as a, the conversation kept going on in the country about possible uh, people to be named the new health minister. What are your thoughts about uh, President Ramaphosa's announcements yesterday, especially in relation to the new health minister? I think we, we are really fortunate to, to have uh, Dr. Joe Parker as our minister of health. Um, I'm one of the people who welcome his appointment because if you remember in 1994 during the first democratic elections, Dr. Joe Parker was the first MEC for health in Limpopo province and his track record at that time were in, there were three uh, governments, the Republic of Venda of that time, the Lebuwa government, Kazankolo, and South Africa in one province that he had to amalgamate and come up with a provincial uh, department of health which supported uh, the national department of health. At that time, our minister was Dr. Nkosasana Gaminsu. So, and also nationally, he's got that particular track record. He has been uh, working closely with both former minister, uh, Dr. Arun Tualedi, and also the recent former minister, Dr. Mkiz. So for me, these are my leaders who I've always looked up to that have continued to mentor me and to raise me. So that's why I see his appointment being positive because as a provincial a government a representing health at a provincial level, I will continue to work uh, supporting him and also learning from his experience and his skills. So we we really fortunate. Equally with uh, Dr. Lomo, who is uh, was uh, the former MEC, I think for two terms at the at Wazunadal, and also recently he was the chairperson of the portfolio committee. So these two individuals are not new to this particular sector. They are familiar with the sector from their student lives as medical students. They have been in the forefront of fighting for the, the, the rights of the students and also for our freedom. So for me, it's like when you have your, your mentors uh, being your seniors and appointed as your seniors, you, you become fortunate and say, I will continue to learn. I'm still in safe hands. Let's come back to our conversation uh, for the day about women in health in recognition of Women's Month, women in health fighting COVID-19. You've been at the forefront of this in Limpopo and Limpopo Health at some points being lauded for uh, managing uh, this very well. Just take us through the motions that you have been going through since March last year, just in terms of 
refocusing your work from the political work of developing policy, but also getting fully involved on the health side and also having to suddenly have to deal with an avalanche of data that had to be updated on a regular basis. How has that been? It has been a, very, a tough journey. It has been a long journey. But I, like I always share with my friends and colleagues that as Limpopo province, we were fortunate to be given an opportunity to house when it was not fashionable, we didn't even know that it was SARS-CoV-2. We were still calling it coronavirus. We had our students in China, Wuhan province, and had to be repatriated. As a province, we were given the responsibility uh, to house them for that 14 days. That meant already we are ahead of our peers because what, it, it, what was going on in my mind is to say, actually, what is this anyone? And, and the public at that time, were very hard on us to say, how do you allow national government to let you bring coronavirus to Limpopo? You don't bring uh, investment, you bring diseases. It was very painful, but it makes us grow stronger and begin to study this virus, which there are no textbooks reference on, on them. There's no professor that you could call at the time, but they have to read through uh, researching and understand how the virus behaves. So that makes us to be uh, much more strong and tougher, such that when we register our first case as a province, we were already ahead in terms of understanding the behavior of this particular virus. So that is why if you see all our ways and strategy that we've been using throughout, when we say those who are in Gauteng, please don't come to Limpopo, it's because we were learning exactly from what happened in China, how they were able to defeat it because they quarantined Wuhan and the people from Wuhan were not allowed to come to uh, any other uh, province. So they were quarantined that side. And equally, when we look at Italy, when they put the country on hard lockdown, the virus then move because it's not the virus that moves people. Because when people move to rural areas where they wanted to be uh, on the lockdown, and we saw the movement of the infection rate going to rural areas where the vulnerable, the elderly people were there and they were sick. So these are some of the strategies that we, we learn by just looking at how other countries have been fighting this pandemic. Equally, even now, when, when the issues of vaccination come in and when we need to roll out, we continue to learn and put up strategies that are very uh, designed for Limpopo because we believe that national government put up systems and put up policies for provinces to implement. So for provinces to implement, you need to make sure that that policy that is designed nationally fits your situation your material condition on the ground as a province, being a predominantly more than 80% rural province, with more than 90% of the population not insured medically, depending on the public health care system. So that is why we had to be ahead. So that's what they, when they say challenges makes you to be more tougher and more stronger. Indeed, you can you can see from us as Limpopo, we we learn uh, from all the challenges that are facing us every day. We we see problems and difficulties as a challenge to test uh, how good we are. And up to so far, difficult as it is, we have lost some of our colleagues in the workplace. It has not been tough. We have never been on on holidays. We have never uh, been on leave. We've been working throughout. When you are done with the wave. While preparing for the second wave, you must also look at the backlog of the health system itself. You see patients with other medical conditions that have not been attended to. You've got to look at the surgical backlogs. So when you are done with that, it's another second wave. When the, you know it has been the routine and never gave us a break. So as I'm saying, mm. it has been a very tough journey. But however, it has made us to be even much more tougher. Dr. Danela Eliasov, you're a specialist psychiatrist. Tell us about how you use your space in the fight against COVID-19. Um, so my space has sort of been plagued with a, an almost a mental health wave. There's been a 
a mental health um, absolute pandemic that's followed with each wave of the COVID pandemic. So we've sort of followed um, followed the pandemic quite closely with regards to as we see a wave in terms of the medical illness, so too people are falling apart psychiatrically in terms of mental health. Um, I'm seeing pathology both as a result of the virus. So the, it seems that there's the virus itself actually attacks the brain or involves the brain neuropsychiatrically or neurologically. So there's that. There's also the, the psychosocial ramifications. So children being in isolation, not being able to go to school as normal, gender-based violence, people being isolated, people not functioning as normal. So there's the sort of the psychosocial aspects as well as the actual neurophysiological um, impact that the virus has itself that we now we now seeing that that's um, that that's a factor too. So they call it like the COVID brain or the um, the neuro the neurological or seeing the proper neurological manifestations of the illness itself. How, how has that process been? So I've, I've found um, myself busier than ever. I mean, I've actually got COVID at the moment, so you're going to have to excuse that I'm actually a little bit, um, maybe not projecting my voice so that. nicely. Yeah, so um, speaking from the horse's mouth at the moment. Tell us um, about it, I, because, I, uh, I, Dr. Inesov, tell us about it, because uh, the, the minute you are tested positive, people are encouraged to stay positive and continue on about their lives while on, on the parallel they're looking after themselves. Just give us your personal account. I think it's important coming from a professional such as yourself. It's been very interesting for me because I've been, you know, sort of preaching to everyone, rest, look after yourself. Um, and then I got some symptoms, I tested and now I'm at home isolating and, and luckily I vaccinated and I was very privileged to be vaccinated um, and, and because I vaccinated, luckily my symptoms are, are, are quite mild and I'm you know really, really grateful that I vaccinated but um, it, it's been interesting having to implement that self-care that I have been telling my patients to do. I've been needing to implement it for myself while at the same time balancing the fact that there's a, a mental health pandemic out there and um, I'm still needing to manage the fact that there's some very ill patients that I'm needing to see as well. So I've, yeah, it's, it's been very, very interesting having to actually implement that with myself. Yeah, and mm. we really appreciate you uh, making the time to talk to us at this time. Let's bring in Dr. Lechweta. Thank you so much for hanging in there. Uh, amazing work mm -hmm. that you've been doing with CSIR in terms of uh, producing and bringing about the first locally produced uh, ventilator. Tell us about this process and uh, how far it's come. The process has, has been uh, a constant steep learning curve, uh, but very fascinating. So from the production side of things, um, the manufacturing of these devices had to happen virtually uh, because um, it happened during the pandemic. Um, it happened when there were so many restrictions and also from a safety point of view. So the CSIR team was um, very agile um, in coming up with what they call a virtual factory where they worked with industry leaders so they could actually monitor the safe um, and efficient production of these devices. Because as you know, you know, um, one of the issues or the main issue is lack of um, oxygenation and people needing oxygenation. So these devices were critical and they needed to be rolled out quickly. Um, that process finished and then that's when we came on board. Um, and our mandate was to make sure that the users on the ground experienced the device as well. Um, so that involved training the users, that involved making sure the devices get there on time, uh, timelessly. Um, and that also involved technical and medical support. Um, so that was very challenging and challenging because we went into an industry where contactless training is not a thing. Um, and so that was very difficult to get the staff to um, accept and to, and to actually get to, 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 to fully absorb themselves in the process. So we launched a training platform um, which trained people on how to assemble the devices, how to use the devices and how to troubleshoot. And that was through a WhatsApp platform. Um, that went well. I mean, these devices were distributed to 400 hospitals, both public and private. It was a total of about 18, uh, 10,400 devices of the 18,000 that have been produced. And that's when we also then ran into some of the challenges um, on the ground. So the private hospitals have infrastructure. So in terms of Wi-Fi connectivity uh, and devices where staff can actually then 
um, look at the videos that, that have been produced, but the public facility struggled because there's no Wi-Fi in public hospitals. And really the, the hospitals that went and ran with this were really staff members who took it upon themselves and utilize their own data to access the videos so they could start using the devices quite quickly. Yeah. Um, um, and, you know, we've come up with a couple of solutions, whether it was loading the training on USBs, but that was the main challenge. The but what I want to ask that- you, Dr. Lechweta, is have these CPAC uh, 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 ventilation, ventilators made an impact in the fight against COVID-19? Absolutely, absolutely. So currently there's 10,400 CPAP devices out there um, and those have been used on patients who would not have otherwise had access to an ICU bed because of limited capacity. So absolutely they've made an impact and the impact can also, not just in the outcomes that we get from the doctors and the feedback that we've gotten from the staff on the ground, but on the fact that there's been continuous ordering of the consumables that go with these CPAPs. So they've made a huge difference because what they've done, they've enabled doctors to ventilate patients in the casualty setting while they're waiting for beds. They've enabled patients to be ventilated in ordinary wards, which is not a thing that happened before. Obviously, there's strict patient selections that need to be adhered to. Not everybody uh, will benefit from the device, but it's made a huge impact, especially in the younger patients. Dr. Ramatuba, let's talk, uh, come back to you. Uh, like I said, Limpopo being lauded for uh, uh, its management of this fight against COVID-19. And uh, the bigger conversation now is vaccination. Uh, you've launched a few activations. When uh, the senior citizen uh, tranche was getting its vaccination, you, you launched an activation then, and then you also were very active when the teachers were getting their vaccination. Can you bring us up to speed in terms of vaccination in Limpopo? Uh, thanks once more, Desri. What, as I've indicated earlier on, uh, to say when National says you are expected to roll out the vaccination, from the beginning we develop a master plan. At first, it was when we were looking forward towards AstraZeneca, where we knew our employees who are within the public sector are around 42,000, including a private sector, we were up around 59,000. And, and at that time, we had to come up with a strategy to say, how are you going to make sure that at least give yourself at most two weeks to vaccinate that number? And it will be new, we will be starting with the sites. That's where we really started planning on, we need to work smart here because it's not going to be easy. And of course, uh, it's history, what happened to AstraZeneca. We participated in Sisonke. What we did during the Sisonke, we took our vaccinators to join those vaccinators of Sisonke, few as the, the Sisonke were. They were working with us so that our teams begin to familiarize themselves with. So when uh, Minister Mkise at that time, uh, our former minister announced that on the 13th of April that we are going to have a self-registration. We, we knew our people are not going to, especially the category of above 60. Firstly, we don't have network where the rural areas. Secondly, this particular body does not, it's not familiar with technology. They don't even know what internet is all about. So we had to come up with mitigating factor. We launched a process of assisting uh, uh, your grandma to register. We were live, that was the first stage, live on Facebook, social media. Call every young person, register your grandma. Just for that day, we register more than 10,000. The game changer was when we introduced our community of care worker. They are currently, they did not draw for all these elderly people, register them. We gave them a smart gadget where they could not find network because that's how it is in the mobile. They will go and collect manually using a form, come back in the office and upload. So when the 17th of, of, of May, when we roll out the vaccine for the above 60, we had already registered so many elderly people. So it was easy for them to come in numbers, but not to, we, we did not stop there. We said to, in order to, because there've been anti-vaccination uh, messages out there, then we say for this category that's above 60, let's try to look at who are the community leaders that inspire them, that they look after them. And we realize that 
our churches, our bishops play a major role here. That's why we have to partner with them, we have to visit them, explain to them what we want to achieve. And we also lose our kings in the province, our queens in the province, even traditional leaders. And it was easy for elderly people to come in numbers. And we also, from the beginning, said we're not going to de depend on the SMS because an elderly lady uh, from Gamakuleke does not have network. She will never receive uh, the SMS. So we are going to use our community of work to say, you come in, we're going to vaccinate you. And you saw some cues would be long up until late. Then when we move to the category of 50, we also continue to look at who are the role models. And even now when we are the, at the 35 to 49, mm -hmm. we're focusing on the soccer coaches and all that. MC, also, I'm going to ask yes. to come in there because we're counting down the minutes now. And I just want to bring in Dr. Eliasov and just quickly tell us about the work you've been doing with athletes in terms of coping with COVID-19. Sorry, I'm just going to ask you to repeat that last few Just to elaborate for us the work you've been doing with athletes uh, in terms of your overall work in helping people cope with COVID-19. So in terms of, I mean, I'm actually working in the COVID world to help with COVID patient um, uh, assistant physicians. So there's been the sort of medical side of it. Um, but also in my All right, you're getting an echo there. Um, Dr. Ramatuba, can we ask you to, to mute your, your connection, please? All right, thank you. Dr. Elisov, you can continue. Um, so I, I, I'm working in the, in the COVID wards with the patients who are, are quite ill with COVID. Um, I've, I've seen some of the neuropsychiatric sort of manifestations of it and, and how neurologically ill patients can become. So there's been that aspect of it. There's also been the patients in my practice um, seeing a lot of youngsters becoming quite quite ill, a lot of anxiety disorders, um, a lot of the youth I think have been suffering developmentally and that they're not interacting with their peers normally. Academic performance has been affected, kids are struggling with online learning um, and, and here we're talking about the more privileged kids. Um, I'm a boxing coach and, I, and a lot and the kids that I treat are in the inner city so they're in Hillbra and a lot of those kids don't have access to internet they don't have access to cell phones to tablets so it's been really a, a tough thing with them getting um, getting them through matric getting them through grade 11 getting them to get through school both socially um, and and academically because they don't have access to the, the actual school material um, kids have been suffering from depression from anxiety um, when we went through the hard lockdown initially um, you know kids not even being able to go outside it, it the profound impact it had on them on every single level um, you know dealing with that and actually and I think my colleagues that I've been speaking you know that have been speaking they're talking both of them I think both of my colleagues that are on with me at the moment talking about learning on the fly um, and coping with things that like no professor ever taught us or no colleague ever prepared us for um, and then coming to me I mean one of my, my little patients came and sat in front of me and he said Dr. Danella I'm scared and I said I'm scared too boy um, and you know you don't know what to say to these kids yeah so it, it's such a reality Dr. Lechwete let's bring you in here as we conclude our conversation and just talk about I know we're it, it's a big deal for the country uh, to have a locally produced uh, uh, machine uh, that ordinarily would have been imported uh, for helping with uh, respiratory challenges. But what other products are, are available that have been created locally uh, to ease the burden of COVID-19 on South Africa? So at this moment, moment I can comment only on the products with regards to ventilation because that's the space um, that we, we we are in. I know that the CSIR is um, working on what they call a BiPAP which is a similar to, to what we've they've produced um, with regards to, to the, COVID, um, the COVID crisis. You know the thing is with this is that um, we, we kind of have to follow a process where we let um, one process feedback to the next process. So our process has been, let's roll out these CPAP machines, let's get feedback because the feedback that we've been getting is feedback that then 
will encourage or will, 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 will contribute to the improvement of the current product, but also feedback that will give us insight on what other products are, are out there. So instead of just producing products that might not necessarily add value, we've, um, you know, taken the route of let's let's let this process give us feedback so that when we do produce further products, it's products that actually add value um, to to the people on the ground and obviously ultimately to the patients that that will require those products. Yeah. Ladies, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Happy Women's Month to all of you and we commend you for the amazing work you're doing in your different spaces. Uh, Dr. Popi Ramatuba is the MEC for Health in Limpopo. Uh, Dr. Ntabiseng Lekhwete, my namesake, is founder and CEO of Quali Health Intelligence. They worked with the CSR in developing a locally produced ventilator called the CPAP. And we also spoke to Dr. Daniela Eliasov, a specialist in psychiatry. Thank you so much to all of you.